In this video, I'm gonna cover one of the most powerful and practical tools that you can use for explaining the effect that various features have on some outcome of interest when you're building some sort of machine learning model. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. All right, so question number one that you should ask before you start building any sort of machine learning or statistical model is, what would the purpose of that model be? In many cases, the goal is prediction. So it could be a classification or a regression problem, but you end up evaluating your model based on some metric like root mean square error in the case of a regression problem, maybe the area under the precision recall curve if it's a classification problem. However, in a lot of other cases, the goal is inference. So maybe you want to understand what are the most important features that influence the response. Or alternatively, maybe there's one particular feature that you're interested in and you want to really deeply hone in on exactly how that feature is expected to influence the response. The most common way to tackle this problem is linear or logistic regression. Again, depending on whether your outcome is continuous or it's a class. And that's pretty understandable. Regression methods allow you to quantify an exact estimate for how much you expect the response, or in the case of logistic regression, the log odds of the probability of the response to change per a one unit increase in the independent variable. So that's a pretty nice, convenient story to tell. And just most stakeholders have at least heard of regression methods, even if they may not understand the math inside and out. However, there's plenty more that we can do as we move to understand the effect that features have on the response. And one tool that you can use in conjunction with all kinds of different machine learning models is what's known as SHAP values. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about exactly what these are. We're gonna walk through the documentation for SHAP values as well as some helpful visualizations you can create. And we'll end with talking about what kinds of models these work with and how these can fit in a machine learning workflow to, again, understand the effect that features have on a response. If all that sounds good to you, smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Something like 70 to 80% of you who watch my content are not subscribed, so please subscribe if you haven't already. All right, so we're gonna start with what SHAP values are in the first place. So SHAP values are also known as Shapley Additive Explanations, and essentially they're based on game theory. So for every prediction that's made by a model, for every feature, they assign a value that tells us how much that feature contributed to the prediction of the response. If you have a positive SHAP value for that feature, that means that feature contributed to a positive prediction. You may or may not have a positive prediction, but that feature got us closer to making that prediction. And so on for a negative SHAP value, that feature contributed to a negative response. So that's simple enough, right? Well, let's look at the documentation and we'll see some ways that we can visualize this. So I highly recommend that anyone who's going to try this out, utilize the documentation. It's really well done. Now there are definitely some nuances here that you might get confused about when you go to interpret results, but I'm going to try to break this down as simply as I can in this video. So just going through the example they provide here, they work with the publicly available California housing data set where there's 20,640 blocks of houses across California and the outcome variable is the natural log of the median home price on that block and we have eight different features. We've got median income, house age, average number of rooms and bedrooms, population, average number of household members in the block, and the block's average latitude and longitude. Now, right off the bat, we're gonna shift the framing here a little bit because we don't necessarily need to have the most predictive model here. The goal with this exercise is just to understand how these features affect the predictions that come out of the model. That is, how do we expect that log median home price to change as these features change? And actually the contrast here to linear model coefficients is pretty instructive as far as the limitations are concerned. We get into a little bias when we start using these coefficients as measures of feature importance because they're often on wildly different scales. 
Although to be fair, you can get around that by just doing some standardization approach, like converting your features into z-scores. I think another really important point to keep in mind though, is that by definition, linear models model the response linearly in terms of every feature. That's a huge assumption that, from my experience, is not really believable in a lot of instances. The beautiful thing with SHAP values is that you can use them and interpret them for models that don't require linearity. For example, the model that I probably use them with the most is XGBoost, for which there's absolutely no assumption of linearity. But anyway, let's go back to the documentation to see how SHAP values were applied to the Zillow data problem. And let's keep in mind as we go along here, it really doesn't matter what model was used, the exact same interpretation of the SHAP values is going to apply. And so as we go through here, there's all different kinds of visualizations that you could use. I'm only going to cover a few that I think are the best and that tell the most powerful, intuitive stories. So this type of plot here is known as the waterfall plot. And what we've got here is a breakdown of a model's prediction for one single instance and how all the different features influenced it. You'll see the values on the left side. Median income is equal to 6.232, latitude is 34.01, so on and so forth. Let's start by reading this at the very bottom. We're essentially starting from the mean prediction of the model on this data, which is 2.215 in this case. We find that the bottom feature, which is called average occupants, contributes plus 0.01, then average bedrooms contributes a reduction of po negative 0.04 to the prediction. And if we go all the way to the top, the biggest influential factor to the prediction is median income, which contributes 0.92 to the prediction for this observation. Once you take that 2.215 and sum all these SHAP values for each feature that we see in the waterfall plot to it, we end up with the model's prediction for that specific observation, that is 2.846. Makes sense, right? Well then, another plot that I really like, because you get to see the big picture for everything, is the bee swarm plot. Now here, we've moved on from plotting one single observation to plotting the SHAP values for all of the observations by feature. And this is really where you see how different levels of the feature are thought to influence our response. On the x-axis, we have the SHAP values, on the left being negative impacts on the response, and the further right being more positive impacts on the model response. And we have this color coding scale here where blue means low feature values and red means high feature values. So let's look up at median income for an example. On the far left, we have a bunch of blue values, which means when median income is low, our response of log home price is low. But then there's these odd red dots on the right. So in those instances, when median income was high, the response was really high. But you can contrast that with the next feature, average occupants. There's this cluster of red to the left. So when that's high, it's bad for our log home price. But when it's low, log house price goes up. So a lot of these have similar structures like that, except longitude, which is just all over the place, going red, then blue, then red, then kind of a mix. And as I said, there's plenty of more visualizations that the SHAP package offers. There's absolute value bar plots, there's heat maps, there's scatter plots. And there's a time and a place for each of those visualizations, but it's been my experience that in almost every instance, when you're trying to tell the story, waterfall plots and bee swarm plots get you what you need. And you can really start to see why these are so powerful in conjunction with your predictive models, because you can really start to see, okay, what happens when my feature is low, when it's a median value, when it's a high value? Of course, SHAP values come with a huge caveat, the way that basically everything in the explainable AI space does. And that is, we have to be extremely careful if we want to make a claim that some change in a feature causes a change in the response. To illustrate that, let's think back to our example where we saw there seems to be a positive correlation between median income and log home price. 
it could absolutely be the case that median income causes the house prices to go up. However, and this may sound a little silly though, you can't really rule out the reverse of that. So it's entirely possible that people in that neighborhood just tend to buy houses that they can't afford. And because of doing that, they get more motivated to change jobs into something else. And as a result, their incomes go up. So you've got the house prices increasing income causally. I don't know, it's not impossible. Or alternatively, the relationship between these two variables could be entirely due to some confounder or just due to coincidence and chance. So unfortunately, to really hone in and answer that question, we need to get a lot deeper into techniques from causal inference. And that's an entirely different topic altogether and frankly, a very complex domain. But anyway, the last point that I'll leave you with is that SHAP values are compatible with a giant range of different machine learning methods. So that includes regression methods, that includes tree-based methods, whether it's something as simple as a basic decision tree or an ensemble method like a random forest or an XG boost. They're compatible with kernel-based methods like support vector machines, and they're even compatible with neural networks. So overall, just as long as you understand the limitations that we have about learning the causes of events, SHAP values are incredible tools. They fit great inside of machine learning workflows as you take a predictive model to the next level with inference. And what you can get from them is far above and beyond what you can get just from looking at something like linear model coefficients or feature importances from tree-based ensembles. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button. Leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. Have you ever used chat values before? Would you like me to do more content around explainable AI and on causal inference? Let me know. Then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard on data.